Good morning, YouTubers. I hope you're having a wonderful day. It's Thursday, 12 p.m., our most common uh, live stream once a week. Then again, second time is uh, Tuesday at 8 p.m., so actually twice a week. I don't know why I said once a week. We've been having twice a week for quite a while, regularly scheduled, so you can always count on it coming the same days, same time. So even when notifications from YouTube inevitably fail, you know that if you show up on those dates, those times, uh, I'll be here as well. As always, I put up a, a poll to see what you guys want to talk about. And most of it's not this overwhelming uh, decision. You know, sometimes we, a couple of times we had decisions where it's literally about one or two percentage points. Today, there is no doubt what you guys want to talk about. Let's take a look for a second here at the poll. And here we see it. And you can see 71% chose the red uh, shell spyware and is embedding spyware in games illegal. I actually thought the second one, which was brought up on Tuesday's uh, live stream, kind of a hypo about the whole EVE Online versus Star Citizens, about the usage of of uh, similar spaceships in each game. I thought that would be kind of an interesting thing to go through, but hey, this is what you want to. And ultimately, remember this is a live stream, so it's all about having a conversation. I want you to put as much, as many comments, as many questions, as many argument as uh, you see fit into uh, the comment section. Just remember always to put at YouTuber Law in front of your comment or really anywhere in the comment. That was just on my end. I see an orange box around it and it tells me to read it. Otherwise, when you're typing in without the at YouTuber Law one word, I'm just skipping it because I'm assuming it's conversation between you guys. Let's take a look, see who's in. Tiva Lester, hi from Miami Beach. Hey, Tiva. Nathan G. A. Zaorsor. Hi. It says, hi, Lior. Zarg. Made it this time. How you doing, Zarg? XXBTA88. Hello and chat. And Random American. Dang it. it was, I was about to get lunch when I noticed the live stream. Oh. This will give you a bit of a diet. You can avoid lunch. Just listen. Uh, Mario Kitsumi, hi from the UK. How you doing? Uh, I've been here waiting for this all day. Oh, thank you so much. I pre appreciate it. Hit Monkey, morning from Oklahoma. How you doing? Uh, how hot is it in Oklahoma nowadays? Is it pretty warm? Uh, it's really, really hot down here in Miami, but it's just about as gorgeous as you can imagine. Uh, Justin White, what is Red Shell? I've never heard of this issue. Perfect. Perfect thing because some of you have been complaining that sometimes we start the conversation and I don't explain the case until, you know, 10 minutes in. So let's start just before we do anything just to explain what's going on. Red Shell is a program. It's a program run by a marketing company and it gets licensed out to video game developers. And it was discovered and first uh, noticed through a, um, a Reddit uh, subgroup that this uh, Red Shell actually exists in a lot of games, some very large game, but really in a very, very large list of games. And that effectively, you don't know it as a gamer, you never authorized it, it's inputted through the developer uh, when you buy or rather license out the game. And it has specific functionality, this Red Shell within the game. While you're playing game, it actually it's kind of an ad tracker slash behavioral tracker. Ba basically, what it does, it, it the developer wants to know what kind of advertising was working for him, right? He placed an advertisement on Instagram, another one on Facebook, another one he sponsored a video on YouTube. Everybody's putting a link. This uh, red shell basically allows him to track how good it is, but not just one way in the sense, which is actually very, very simple. It's something that Google does all the time. Not just simply saying, you know, it's, it's one directional, this ad drove traffic here. That doesn't require much or really any kind of uh, tracking of who you are, but rather it collects some certain information. Now, it, according to Red Shell and to the developer, it collects information that they consider to be rather benign, and we'll talk about that. Other people feel that it's completely irrelevant. Once you go beyond a simple track like you know this cell of this game came from this particular ad once you start once you actually residing within a, 
a, a game mainly within my own computer system and you're sending out information from within. So it's not an advertisement tracking, it's really come from within your own computer. Many consider it to be spyware, many say it, it was unauthorized since I never knew it existed, I never authorized it's a third party. If I bought a game through Steam associated with a one developer, I signed the agreement with Steam, I signed the agreement with a developer, I never signed the agreement with Red Shell, and I didn't know that this information is being uh, transferred. So that's the Red Shell story. It, exploded once people discovered how many games were really implementing red shell within the games and the question is you know what are they doing are can they do it do they need my authorization is it illegal is it something that i just have to live with and as long as it once everybody starts screaming developers will pull it out and and be a little more transparent but there's nothing the law can says that's really the storyline there's been lots of discussions over this Obviously, everybody from the gaming community believes that, at the very least, absent authorization, this should be an impermissible behavior. It's maybe at some point unethical. Some people question whether or not it's legal or not, but the very least, there should be some authorization uh, given. And then there are some people who say, well, they understand what developers need. It's part of their business uh, strategies. They need to know what how stuff is sold, but then again, it all comes down to where it's residing, where it's operating. And toward that, those answers, we actually have quite a while, quite a number of cases. We've had cases, I would say, dealing with spyware since early 2000s. So we had some uh, 17, 18 years worth of cases, mostly driven through the federal government and the Federal Trade Commission. But we'll go through, through basically six or seven different laws, all on federal level, though there, there is now I think over 20 states have also state laws dealing with spyware. We'll kind of go through this, try to explain what the law permits, what it does, and then how Red Shell fits within that. And you'll also understand through the process that it's kind of a difficult uh, game they're playing. And sometimes companies like Red Shell kind of falls in between uh, permissibility and impermissibility and uh, what uh, the Federal Trade Commission has gone after in, in the past. And sometimes it's difficult to go after companies like Red Shell or the developers that implement them, and we'll go through that process. Thanks for the question early on, so I re remember to actually uh, give a bit of the background. Also, let me know, guys, if the video and the audio is good, so I know that uh, I'm doing well here. Egal Marcello Zimit, are you going to cover the lawsuit from Jordan Peterson? Only once I find the the complaint or the statement of claims in uh, Canada. Right now, it's just I'm not gonna. I don't do videos based on what other people are saying, so I'm not gonna do it based on articles written or other vlogs. I know that he spoke. I saw his video probably. Uh, I don't know, if maybe a week ago, uh, where he gives some information about what he's suing. That's just not enough. I mean, I don't want to do it this way because you can imagine some of the cases we've spoken about. If I listen to the plaintiff tell their story how convoluted and probably it would have been so I'm not saying that he would have any in any way uh, said anything inappropriate it's just that if I'm going to analyze a case it's going to be if I can actually find the complaint other than that I'm not going to do it I did send him a, a tweet uh, uh, asking for a copy of the complaint I didn't hear anything a bunch of you retweeted it and liked it so maybe that will have some some say but I'm assuming somebody like him gets so many messages that this probably will uh, fall by the wayside. I'll keep looking. Eventually, it finds its way. Some website, some article, somebody uh, will find that complaint, and then I'll I'll review it and do it. Hitmonkey, whoops, lol. Morning from Oklahoma. Hey, doing Hitmonkey? It got 98 yesterday with a feel of 104. So just a little. More. That is, yeah, we don't get uh, that hot down in, in Miami. Humid as hell, but never that that kind of heat. Uh, Justin White, how is it different from any other analytics tracker that the developer implements from Google Analytics? Well, that's what it comes down to. That uh, we already know that developers' websites, uh, mobile apps, they all place uh, cookies on your machine. That's not new. You agreed to that so many times. But this is different, right? A cookie is kind of like a fingerprint, so somebody... So there's a connection between you and an advertisement. Not saying it's right or wrong, 
but first of all, it's become accepted. Everybody knows it's there. It's in every single terms of service, and it's implemented directly by the whoever, the owner, the sponsor, the, the, the website operator, the mobile app developer, the game developer. It's provided to them directly. This is different. This is a third-party software that actually gets downloaded into your computer system along with the, uh, the, the game uh, software. Now, whether or not it's actually implemented into the game and then download it together or it's actually separate, it's almost irrelevant. It's an independently operated uh, code that is run essentially by a third party that shares the information with the developer as well. So there's real, uh, there's a, there are issues about who collects it what they can collect and what they actually collect. There's a lot of different things, you know, and then what capability are they giving to the developer? Are they main, is the original developer of Red Shell maintaining certain controls or is it up to the developer himself to implement? There's a lot of issue because all of that is residing within your computer and it's capturing information that you're generating, not just basic tracker of where it's coming from, user generated information and sends it out and that's kind of the, the the issue here that makes it a little bit different and no and the very fact that nobody knew that's one thing you're not expecting you're not expecting third-party code within the game you might be expecting some sort of a tracking system downloaded provided through that you might look through the developers terms of service their eula their privacy policy to see what's happening but when this is actually implemented by a third party that's the problem. The question is what is happening there. Uh, Justin, wide video audio is great this time. Awesome. Thank you. Mario Kitsumi, will you be covering the EVE Online versus Star Citizen in detail at a later point? I am, I am biased in this since I am an EVE player. Well, we're not going to do it today, but I'll post it again for Tuesday. And if nobody covers, because I think it's kind of a cool story, I'll either do a video on it. I, I'm, I'm not able to do recorded videos uh, this week, so I'll either do a recorded video about it for uh, next week, or we'll discuss it depending on how you guys vote on it. My 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 gut feeling tells me because I already have my topic for Monday that I've been working on for quite a while that I'll put it up as a poll for Tuesday, and if you guys reject it as a as a discussion point, then I'll just do a, a video probably for the next day for uh, Wednesday. Tiva Lesser, all sounds all good as sound. All good with sound. Uh, Zorosaur, audio and video is okay. Killercraft136, hey man, you're still the best. Keep it up. Congrats on 20,000 subs. Thank you so much. Gvel1349, hi Lior. CA immediately dropped red uh, shell when people noticed it in the Total War games. Yes. Um, many, many. It's surprising that some developers actually said they're going to keep it, that they're not going to drop it. You know, it's not. It's something that once you irritate your your uh, user base for nothing for no other reason. If you even if you feel you're right, it's probably smart to drop it. But I don't know why not everybody uh, dropped it. But you're right. Uh, Xber, Xber, greeting for the Phil Xber sixteen. Sorry, greetings from the Philippines and Mangundang Tangali over your place. Thank you. If it's a nice thing, thank you. I. Don't know what it means, but it sounds like it's uh, almost a blessing. So thank you so much if it is. If it's not, I would know. Uh, NDC, surely this breaches the EU's recent data protection policy? That's a big question. And, and there are actually discussion back and forth over it, whether or not the, the code itself is GDPR compliant, but not necessarily the implementation by each and every developer because there's control. So there are definitely questions about uh, that issue because, for those who don't know, in uh, Europe, it's basically they've set up an opt-in, uh, an opt-in process where basically you can't just start collecting information without asking people's permission. And in this case, that's one of the things you find out that there is no opt-in. There's an opt-out at some point. You're able, if you want to, get out of it, but there's no opt-in. So the assumption is it's going to violate the GDPR, but whether or not the software itself is violating EU's privacy laws or rather the implementation by the developer and how they implement it is a violation. That's another issue. Let me jump in and, and start, uh, start the conversation here. So we go from here.
Great. So as we spoke earlier, red shell is what they are referring to, what the company providing red shells is referring to as a marketing attribution uh, tool, allowing developers to figure out what advertisement works best for them. Now, again, we've seen this many times before in a bit in uh, through simple cookies that uh, track uh, advertising behavior. Why is this different? Because this is actual code that actually sits in your uh, in your own computer and gathers information. It's not a mere cookie, almost like a fingerprint. It's it's a uh, it's somewhat bigger than that. And let's take a look actually at what they're saying because this started out and everybody is getting aggravated. Let's just see what what uh, they say about Red Shell itself, right? So this is what the company says. It says we don't collect the names, emails, or addresses. It says our service basically says this computer clicked on a link from this YouTube video and the same computer played your game. We have no interest in tracking people, just computers for the purposes of attribution. Now, that's an interesting statement for them to, to make. And part of the problem that you see in all of these uh, kind of where, and I'm gonna call it spyware because it's just easier for me, but, and I know there's an, obviously a negative connotation and I'm not, you can determine whether or not, but just as a way of describing it, I'm calling, calling it a spyware. The problem with spyware is, that what they tell you it does. And even if you actually look at the code and see what kind of information it actually collects is can be very, very different than what it's capable of, right? Just think about it like a, like a recording device. A recording device can record something and do it completely legally, but can also be illegal, right? You can use a, a digital recorder. We just talked about it in the Lindsay Shepard case. She recorded through the computer where she can record a conversation in Canada perfectly legal. If she did the same thing in Florida, she uh, can get arrested for it because it's an illegal activity in the state of Florida instead of California, where it's a, every party has to, both parties have to agree to it. So sometimes just because what you're doing is okay does not mean that the software itself is not capable of doing something far greater. And with spyware, it, 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 that can be very problematic because if you build a tool effectively that can collect information, but you're now restricted to specific issues, you've just download just forced people to download into their computer software that can be, if now or in the future, purposely manipulated. It can be a tool later on that can go far beyond the parameters set originally. And nobody knew about it. Nobody agreed on it. You basically, people basically downloaded uh, a time a, a time bomb there that can go off at any moment, either by through the developer or, or the uh, or Red Shell itself, the advertising software, or potentially through somebody else that uh, finds a, a hack into it that can actually activate it. That's part of the problem here. So when they're saying, "Look, we are we don't care about who you are. We're just trying to get basic information: which computer clicked on what." That's true. If I guess if you look at it and you do an audit, you say, okay, that might be a true statement, but it's, but it's a little more problematic than that. And then they went on to say something else here. This is a, a quote from an article. It says, Red, this is what Red Shell says in the article. Hold on a second, let me close this out. Red Shell tracks information about devices. We collect information, including operating system, browser version number, IP addresses anonymized through one-way hashing, screen resolution, in-game user ID, and font profile. So now you're getting to all this and take a look at all this stuff. It's it's fascinating what they're saying here. So you say, well, why do you care about that, right? I'm collecting, you know, what's your uh, browser ID? Well, I mean, okay. And, I mean, not browser ID, your type of browser, your operating system, um, what? your font profile, I don't know what the hell that means, my font profile, what fonts I'm using. There's definitely a question about whether or not that's actually what's being collected through a font profile. But nonetheless, but at the very least, they're acknowledging in-game user ID. Now you got some issues here, right? And now you can argue which user ID, the user ID in Steam or is a user ID within the game itself. Generally, the way privacy, privacy law has worked uh, 
through, I would say, through from the beginning of, of online privacy. The idea was that personally identifiable information, which is what the law is mostly concerned about, things that ultimately can identify you, usually involved at having two items. Because obviously, if something identifies you directly by saying, you know, this is this is Lee or Lesser, that's identifying, that's not an issue at all. It's obviously going to be uh, personally identifying information. But two items can be. The idea is if you take two things and if you put them together, that identifies the person. And here in this li list, you've got a user ID and you got at least some version of anonymized IP address. The problem being that it's not that difficult to get it to put it and actually identify individuals. So at least you get very close to identifying in individuals through it. Not to mention that uh, through behavior and everything else, you can actually put together information to identify who the individual. So even though they're saying this is not personally identifying, so don't worry about it. Well, when you get into things like user ID, especially when so many user ID actually includes somebody's name, maybe a first name, maybe first and uh, last name. So the idea that it's not problematic, well, that's questionable. Now, let's go through some of the questions here before we jump into what the law actually says about all of this. Justin White, I'm an indie developer, so I'm actively interested in this topic, even though this is the first I've heard of it. It's, there is some great, if you look it up, just put uh, Red Shell Spyware, one of, not only is there some good articles, there's, uh, the really good one is to actually look through the Reddit sub, the subreddit and uh, actually see what people were complaining about and how they're identifying games and how people are responding to it. So it's actually pretty interesting. Justin White regarding third-party access. So is Google Analytics correct, but completely uh, correct. But if you look at every single privacy policy that's been written over the ten, last 10 years, it will say that we are actually that you do actually mention either will mention Google Analytics specifically or the fact that they're using third party uh, cookies to track certain behavior and to enable certain functions that that is permissible. It's actually something that everybody's expecting and everybody knows what is being collected. And basically, it's a minimal kind of uh, tracking. The cookie is, is not sitting around in the background grabbing information off of your computer basically and communicates it out to a, a third party that's what's not happening it's a cook those are usually things implemented directly it's not google that's implementing it it's actually implemented directly by the developers there through permission and actually noticed by it through their privacy policy it's the lack of notice there's no point where you would have read well there's two ways because it almost doesn't matter uh, but, well, to say it doesn't matter, it's, it's not true. In some cases, depending on which law you're going based on, it does matter. The question is whether or not there was notice, and that's at the heart of it. Either there is zero notice, meaning no, no developer put it into it, and you can bet, like I said, Google Analytics is always covered within a privacy policy. This is not. And the very fact that it's it's a third party that's actually collecting and sending it out, that's problematic. So there's no uh, no notice of it within the privacy policy, no acknowledgement, you're not authorizing it. It's a fact a third party that's collecting and transmitting that information. It's not your developer. So through the download of the game, you've enabled this third party to collect information. You have no idea what they're doing with it. There is no indication whether or not it's it's information that goes all the way to the developer and then maybe get erased. Does Red is does Red Shell maintain that information? Do they maintain the ability to resell it? I can tell you that they say that they don't resell it, but there's it's not in any sort of authorizing document like a privacy policy. So this is where you get into all those issues about ultimately authorization. Sometimes it's not there at all, and not necessarily with Red Shell, but in other ones, sometimes it is covered in the in in somebody's either in the EULA or the privacy policy. Privacy policy is really where it should be included. And there you've got an issue because if I put something like that in a privacy policy, do you necessarily know to expect it? And that's a huge part of it. You know, on the one hand, we're going based on the idea that if, especially in the United States, not true necessarily now in Europe, that if I put it into the privacy policy or also in the terms of service and you sign it by acknowledging it, you're going to be held to it. 
the problem is that we are so accustomed to clicking on it. We've read a bunch of this stuff. We're so accustomed to them accepting and clicking on authorizing it. Then when there's something that's so different, so unique, something that we didn't expect, the question is whether the law would authorize that. Whether the law would say, you know what? You never authorized it. It means you authorize it in the terms, but since you never expected it, you, it shouldn't be binding. And you find that that's actually the case when something is so different, so unique, for instance, and this is not new stuff. This is stuff that's been existing since, for at least the last uh, 10 years. You download a game, it's going to be free. And they tell you, you know what? We're going to give it to you for free for the first three months. Right? So you download it, you play the game. If you don't expect the fact that after three months, they are automatically are going to uh, charge you, right? You think after three months, I will have to pay for it. But in fact, after three months, they're sending you an invoice, a bill starting to demand uh, money for it. Maybe they, uh, maybe they get collection agency after you. You'd be amazed how often that. So regulations passed through the FTC actually start prohibiting it. it says, because there's no expectations as to whether or not somebody, after a, a trial period, somebody's going to be charged automatically or not, you've got to do something else about it. So when you get into it, when you get into free trial, you've got to put it in a, in a very prominent place above all the, uh, the terms of service. Maybe you include it as part of the acknowledgement and signing process. That's what we're getting into. That even if it's in the documentation, but if it's something so different than anybody expects, nobody knows it's coming, that the law will not necessarily uphold it because they say, you know what, given the nature of the contract, if it's so strange that it's never there, then we don't have to uphold it. Here, the essence flux, a bit off topic if you allow a 2D image to be uploaded to a server by the players of a game, are you responsible to ensure it's not copyrighted material or is forbidding it and banning pe players who do it enough? Let me see. If you allow, okay. If you are running a service that allows people to upload the documentation, you are protected. Basically, you're completely indemnified, no different than then uh, Facebook if when, and Instagram whenever you upload uh, pictures to it or YouTube when you upload uh, videos. This Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act that would protect you saying as long as uh, you cannot be held liable for, for infringing, proper, the infringing items provided by, uh, by your users. That being said, in copyrighted material like what you're talking about, you have to implement a process called a DMC through the DMCA that it will be usually in your terms of service that says that if you receive a notice in a specific format that something is infringing, you will take that image down immediately and then you provide notice to the person that, uh, that whose picture you removed it, they then get a chance to submit uh, a counter notice and then within 10 days you would re-upload it. You have to go through the DMCA process. Any other user content like involving defamation and stuff like that, you're not liable at all under Section 230. But when it comes to copyright, you've got to put the process. You're not liable as long as you follow the process. You fail to follow the process, then you are, then you can be held liable and they can sue you if you fail to take it down so after you're receiving the, the DMCA takedown. Good question. Justin White. No. Yeah. Everything is third party. If I have a PlayFab as my backend server, that's third-party code, and they do all the analytics and user heat maps. The question is, I, I don't argue with that. The question is, what do people know, and what kind of notice do they have to get? And basically, what happens to that data? And that's all going to come through the privacy policy here. The problem being that the line between analytics and spyware has become very, very fine. Because you are when you're downloading code that has capabilities far beyond necessarily how it's implemented today, that creates a time bomb that you did never actually authorize. Now, 
I'm with you. I mean, I think just about everybody would agree that some analytics is required because that really enables the entire economy, right? We all need to know what's more effective, what's less effective, how, to, how, how we acquire traffic. But it's all about not notification. And when something is other than expected, that's when notification should be prominent and your authorization should be required. And that's where it comes down to. Now, we'll go through it in one second, go through it, and I think we'll, we'll get a better understanding of what happened by going through the actual laws involved here. So give me, just hang in there one second. Uh, Jack Ice. Hey, from the Philippines. How are you doing? 12 a.m. here. Wow. Le very late. I'm sorry I'm late, but I remembered to hit the like button. Thank you so much, everybody. Please hit the like button. It's a, it basically makes it more likely that there will be notifications sent to everybody while the stream is live versus only after the stream is live. So thank you so much. Kaz Walker, I'm a software developer, but not familiar with Red Shell. I will call it unethical if Red Shell was able to run in the background after the main application was terminated. I, I don't disagree with you. And actually, there's some legal issues with something like that to begin with. The claim is that it doesn't, that, that it's triggered that it's downloaded through a fingerprint. Basically, when you, let's say you go to an ad, you're downloading effectively a fingerprint that ties you to that ad and that it's triggered, mainly it starts operating once the game itself is initiated and on. So it only operates while that is on. Again, you get down to those technicalities. Let's say, for instance, that the software gets gets runs the entire time in the background versus one that gets triggered. It doesn't take much to so it's again it's based on capabilities or versus what it's actually doing today. The question is, should that be the basis? Well, if you're operating in a certain way, it's okay versus operating in a different way. Or should the law says, look, you're downloading something, you've got to get authorization. I'm authorizing the game developer. I'm not authorizing you. And we need to change the way we interact with all these developers through line item kind of uh, authorization. Right now, you present it with a privacy policy. Even, even a short one is going to be about two, three pages long if it's really going to be comprehensive with an I accepted the whole thing. Maybe we need to move beyond that kind of the concept. If you think about it, that if you go and you lease a car, not only are you signing at the last page, a lot of times you're initialing different pages, sometimes initialing different items. Maybe that's what's needed, you know. Sorry, but this particular provision regarding our usage of third-party uh, code that's going to sit in your 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 game, that needs to be initial and authorized. And frankly, if you don't want to do it, the whole thing doesn't operate. You get your money back, or if you allow it, you know you have some control. But that's I think that's part of the issue here. Now it's quite possible that the way it was operated should not have given anybody any concern. It's basic analytics, and nobody should have given concern. But anytime something happens that is unexpected, it feels suspicious. And that's a big part of what happened here. Jack Ice, Magdang, Tangali means good afternoon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Kaz Walker, also, if he was accessing information by non public API from other local applications, I don't know the answer to that. Also, if it was access information by non-public API, I, I, I literally don't know the answer to that. Um, let's go through and ha have a discussion here. Just wrote some notes down because I there's so many different laws I want to cover here. And the first one, and we kind of discussed it in the past, called trespass to chattel. The idea ultimately is somebody coming onto your property, depriving you of something, right? Yeah, right. So whether or not I'm, I'm taking something, you can't use it or really just preventing it. So I don't actually have to own it. I can actually prevent you from uh, using it. So I'm, I'm, I'm preventing you from enjoying something here. The argument being that by downloading unauthorized uh, software into your uh, computer, they are basically taking information that are otherwise belongs to you. Who, who has rights to information related to what operating uh, uh, system you're using? Without authorization, it's yours. 
you have to get the idea is that it's not important. None of us care. I mean, somebody asked me for it. I don't care. It doesn't make a difference to me. I don't see it, how it's going. I mean, obviously, it can be used uh, inappropriately if you have more information. You'll know what kind of uh, virus to potentially send my way. But other than that, it's not something that I particularly care about. But then again, is it really my information? Is it your your? Should you have an, an unauthorized ability to just get that information because you feel that there's some value in it? Because ultimately, if there's value, I should be willing to give it or not give it. You know, I should be able to think about it, see how the the game the your software operates. Does he have capabilities far beyond what it is? And so that's that's how you, it's called trespass to chattel. And the problem with that law is that. They've tried to use trespass to chattel when it comes to spyware or on the unauthorized downloading of software, sometimes in different formats like adware and uh, malware and stuff like that, is that it's been inconsistent. And a big problem with it is damages because you have to prove a certain level of damages when it comes to trespass on chattel, usually looking at around $5,000. And the reality is if I have a game, right, if I download one of these game, uh, which what what is one of them? I believe Elder Scroll. Can you tell me what my damages would be? If anything, they might be minimal or really non-existent. It's a problem here, right? So you can say that they would have violated the law had it caused damage. Now, some cases says, you know what? Anytime you download software into my computer, you are consuming some of its uh capabilities, right? You might be slowing it down. You might be preventing other operations from working. So maybe we can get damages that way. The problem is quantifying it and saying that it's in excess of something else. It's just like a tort, you know, it, 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 is it beyond a certain amount? And that's the problem. So you've got the concept that you can't take away something from me. And even if you can get there by saying that anytime you download software and you start running something, in the background and you're consuming some of my uh, resources on my computer, short of saying you're damaging my computer, which we have in some other cases we'll talk about, short of going in that route, trespass to chattel has not necessarily worked very consistent as, as a law. Zalibur 16, it's specifically good, good noontime and you're welcome, Lior. Kirk uh, Walcott, can you go into laws regarding recording in the U.S. been trying to look more into local laws, but I have no ideas where to look at. Are we speaking about recording as in what uh, what happened with Lindsay Shepard, mainly with or with not the authorization of another individual? I mean, if that's the case, I'll give you the 30 second background on it. It's state by state. It's not a federal matter. You look in every state and we have two different uh, kinds of state. Florida, California, you know, many, many states require that both party agrees. Otherwise, it can be actually a criminal offense here. In Florida, you can be arrested. If she did that uh, in Florida, that she would be arrested if she had recorded uh, somebody without asking for permission. Other states like New York, one party has to agree, mainly as long as you're part of the conversation. Generally, you would say that you are not allowed to record surreptitiously other people. That's like kind of a wiretap. You're not allowed to record other people's conversations. So unless you're party to it, you're not, not going to be allowed to record it. If, you are, if you're the party but the other one doesn't know about it, you got about half the states like New York that will allow it and other states that require both uh, people. If, this, uh, not, if I answered the wrong question, just let me know down below. Justin White, OS browser version, I.O., etc. These are all things that developers gather anyway because we need it. IP address might be identifiable, but developer use that to implement game bans. Without that, it'd be difficult to ban hostile players. Any sysadmin admin needs the IP player. I do not, I completely agree with you. And it might be that over time, we should be able to grant more information. But I think we've reached that point. And I, look, if, if this happened maybe five years ago, maybe it wouldn't be uh, as much of a concern to people, but in the environment where we're in, where we see on, on the one hand companies like uh, Facebook completely obfuscating what happens to your data, who is who's collecting, who is not, what they're doing, how they can be transmitted. 
and you've got Europe changing it, the basis of its uh, privacy law to require explicit authorization from its user. We are left in a position where I think that this people are rightfully concerned and they say this was unexpected. And that's what you get. Was there authorization? I will guarantee you that in, their, in, in every developer's uh, EULA as well as Steam's terms of service, it says that such basic information is being collected like IP, OS, everything else. But that means that, but that you, that usually means that the developer or Steam in our case as a platform is the one who's collecting it. What happens when, you, when other third parties have access to it? Well, if it's Google Analytics, we have information how it's being handled. Now it's not being handled. We have some, some comfort level over time that we know that they're not selling it that it's directed toward the, the website operator or, or the mobile app operator. Maybe we have a wrong impression of that. Maybe we shouldn't be so complacent when it comes to trusting Google with uh, their own technology. But when there's an unknown third party that hasn't been authorized, it's not explicitly provided for in the terms, that's what you're getting into. It's all, every single one of these laws is going to hinge on one thing, unauthorized. And we've got cases and lawsuits and massive lawsuits and banning by the federal government of companies doing things unauthorized. Usually you're finding some sort of a damages, but usually but it's all about the unauthorized access. So it's not about the content because like I said, I'm going to assume that even Google, if it wanted to, could manipulate its, uh, its ad tracker to collect more information than they do right now. It's probably not a very difficult thing. That's at the heart of it, you know, our, our knowledge, not only that what we're getting is uh, actually doing something that's very limited, but also that it shouldn't have capabilities far beyond what it is. And if it, if it does, we should be explicitly authorizing it. And if anything changes, we should be getting information on it and how it's being shared. And that's the kind of stuff that's lacking here. And that's what the law usually focuses on. Justin White. IP, no, did I, I think I read it, XXBTA88, didn't Sony get sued and lose those rootkit scandal? How would Retro be similar and how different would it be? I, I'm not familiar with the Sony uh, case, so I can't uh, respond to that, sorry. Lighter Gas, is this a new thing? I've been a gamer for a good 20 years, I've never heard of it before, love the show. Uh, thank you so much, it's, it's not new. It's, it's new in the sense that people discovered it and and right now it's spreading like wildfire and people are angry and more than that is a result of that and people sending specific requests to Steam and to the game developers. The game developers have actually been dropping Red Shell. So it's the reaction that's new more than the practice. There's, there's, been, there's been weird stuff happening all along, but if you think about it, even early 2000s, this happened all the time in different format, right? Where you would download uh, a game for free and suddenly your browser uh, would change and some, instead of uh, browsing on Google, you would browse with some unknown element that will show you pop-up ads and suddenly you'll get a bar with all these advertisements on top. That's This is how it all started out. This is obviously is much, much more... I don't know, uh, this is, doesn't have the kind of problems that we saw in the early 2000s. And that's when the government really started jumping on it because they really saw damages. They saw, you know, all these spyware, malware and uh, spam being thrown at people and people not knowing how to properly manage those kind of items. The result of which was uh, that ga the computers were damaged that computers uh, were slowed down, Com some aspects of computers actually stopped operating, their ransomware, we got involved in ransomware, the ability to damage your computer and then ask ask you to pay to fix it, things like, like that. So it started more maliciously. This is obviously far, far less. It's the, it's, but the problem is it comes after all, all that history that we've gone through, including Facebook and what's happening in Europe. So it's that explosion of gamers who are just upset at this, of having said, you know what, I just didn't authorize this. This is not 
I knew that I was getting a game from XYZ. Why is this third party software implemented and potentially sitting there and intercepting information as I'm playing? Justin, why I agree regarding notice. Developers are likely in the wrong for not giving notice in the terms of service. Agree. So that's where trespass on chattel doesn't really work. So let's look at the second law, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, we also spoke about in the past. It's basically federal law that actually places criminal sanctions on basically your unauthorized access to a protected computer system. And originally, the, comp the idea of a computer, a protected computer, was more involving financial matters. But it's really now everything. Your own computer, your cell phone, because this. It also includes inter-state inter, uh, commerce, which pretty much you do with your cell phone, right? You know, you can buy things from Amazon, you can uh, call people, you can do the same thing on your computer. So virtually every computer system that is personal is now a protected system. So it is absolutely illegal, criminal, in, in fact, to uh, access your computer without any sort of uh, authorization. The problem is exactly the same as in the uh, trespass to chattel is that it requires some damages something has to happen you know that's why you usually see it in a hacking kind of cases when somebody hacks and steal the information it hacks or disable information or or uh, tries to uh, negatively impact the performance of uh, certain servers so that's where usually you see it because you can then compute some damages that often are far beyond the computer because ultimately if you're trying to reach some some threshold of about five thousand dollars most computers i mean uh, not true if you're a gamer and you can have very expensive computer but most computers do not rise to that level of, of price so it's very very difficult you know in some of these laws maybe you can do a class action lawsuit but usually it's it's, it's it, usually it's not those are very difficult to pursue so even though it's illegal to access a, a, a protected computer system, if if you cannot prove damages to it in one way or another through th theft of information or damages to the computer itself or let's say malware you basically uh, or uh, ransomware or something like that, it's very, very difficult to pursue a case like that as well. Armin uh, Hardinger. Hello again from Sussex UK. How you doing? If they want that data, they should create an incentive for the owners of the data to share it. I'd say a free skin if you uh, auto-generate the system detail. I, I, I agree. It's, I, you know why? Because they're charging full price for the game. If you told me it's a free game, but we collect information, then that's my incentive, right? It's a free game or highly discounted. But if somebody's paying $60 for a game, you know... To me, that sounds like a full price here. Don't uh, put unauthorized uh, software on it. I mean, don't do it anyway because it. But I agree with you. You should, if it's so valuable, create a way of paying for it without any cost. A skin has zero cost to them, right? I mean, somebody has to at some point create it, but it's a zero cost uh, payment. And you're right; they can use that to acquire. Why do you think they don't do that? Because they don't want to be obvious in the, what they're collecting and i told you before i mean i've my entire career really is in uh working on these kind of agreements you know terms of service privacy policy rules for games uh, sweepstakes contests prizes all these licenses and eulas and everything else and these privacy policy issues are our problem because on the one hand developers want to collect as much information as possible. They want everything. Often, they have no idea how they're going to use it. They don't have any so, like bad ideas. They, they just want to collect it, so potentially it has value down the line, right? Maybe we'll need it down the line for something weird. So they want to collect everything. But they know that if they put a huge orange box and says, you know, we collect everything, we, we keep it for the rest of, of your lives and even beyond that, and we can use it any which way. By the way, we're not using it today. You might be might have a problem with that. So luckily for them, the way the law developed in the United States, as long as they throw it into a privacy policy, provide maybe a basic link that you would have to uh, click on and then you have to read through, 
and then get, get accept, most likely 99% will not read, read that. And so they're banking on people not reading those uh, things. So that's why they don't want to put front and center. Maybe that's where we're moving to. I think that we need to have line item uh, authorizations. Things, certain things have to be authorized beyond the I accept, you know, like this particular item needs to be accepted. This item needs to be accepted. People know what they're expecting, which will give them developers uh, the opportunity to do exactly what you're saying. You know, by the way, if you accept this, I'll give you a skin or something else that otherwise doesn't cost them anything. But that will change the entire relationship between you as the gamer and the developers because suddenly you're agreeing to things and you will have questions, right? Well, what's collecting it? What can it collect? How is it restricted? You know, how is it going to be used? It's going to be shared with third parties. If it's collected by third parties and again, give it to the developers, are they retaining anything? See, it'll make you ask questions. And the one thing that online marketers hate is question. Anything that would encourage you to do more than a single click means that the conversion rate falls. That you don't have no idea how many discussions I, I have with clients about that entire issue because, and it's true, they can show you statistically how the more clicks, the fewer the conversion, right? So the idea is show this, I accept, this is the conversion. The minute you do more, right? Instead, let's say, in, let's say suddenly, instead of just having a link and, and, and a policy, they actually present you with a policy and they require you to scroll to the bottom, not read, just scroll. And then the accept is shown, that's going to reduce the conversion rates. And that's the problem is all this stuff. So they're battling the idea that they want information. They know they have to tell it to you, but conversion rates are going to drop the more, either the longer it takes or the more clicks are required. So until the law comes in and actually clarify this is what's demanded it's a really hard sell because on their own developers and industry uh, associations they don't want to push that kind of a uh, kind of a stance that will require your line item approval of specific things justin wise yeah i never read a privacy policy i'm horrible they're boring and let me know that's it i've written probably in the hundreds of those do you think I sit around reading uh, these policies when I'm the, the consumers? No. It's just the, the reality of it that we all know that nobody reads it until there's a problem. Then we read it. Shallow revelations. After this has settled and the information has already been used and spread about third-party companies, could the fines be so small it's just the cost of doing business? That's, that's, that, that's very smart. That's... In many ways, that's exactly, and it's nothing to do also with online. I mean, you know, it, you see it many times in other practices as well, where you know where something is permissible or not. You know that, you know, there's a gray area, and then the lawyer tells you, well, this is your potential losses, liability at the end of the day, and you calculate. Let's say your li potential liability is ten, twenty thousand dollars and you say, you know what, I have a potential of making 300000 say, you know what? Maybe I'll take it. It's one of the reasons why the FTC has been trying over time, the Federal Trade Commission, trying to get more power when it comes to spyware to be able to actually go after uh, not just damages and fines, but actually have uh, to actually go after people civilly so they can actually sue for, you know, $12 million, something that will be so astronomical that will stop those kind of behavior. So if the only punishment is just have to do with damages and some basic fine for uh, for not following a specific regulation, the, the impact of those kind of uh, laws is going to be very, very minimal because, like you said, it just goes into the calculation. Armin Hardinger, thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you for addressing my comment. Thank you so much. And... Somebody else uh, also gave a super chat. I'm not sure who it is because there's no comment, but thank you so much for that as well. Let me see where we are. Okay, let me jump to the third one, which is the Stored Communication Act. And the idea there is that 
your compu computer is obviously communicates all the time, right? And if there is an unauthorized software that captures that communications, that's an illegal activity. Again, it's something that the Stored Communication Act would go after. And the argument with a lot of uh, spyware is that because it's, it's capturing information and then sending it out, or it's information that otherwise would be sent out, for instance, when you are uh, clicking certain, when you're using your computer and you're sharing certain information through your usage of your computer with the server, and they're capturing parts of that, that's a communication. They're not capturing emails and, and direct messages, but while, rather they're capturing, they're taking information that is, that is either communicated or is being stored. Actually, this is the stored communication. Sorry, I'm jumping. This is the communication that's being actually stored on your computer. Information that will be at some point uh, sent out that would be illegal. The other side of it is the Wire uh, Act, which actually looks at whether or not you are trying to capture information as it's being sent back. So as communication is being sent by from the computer let's say, to the server you're capturing, both of those have been used at times to go after uh, spyware. Again, not very consistent, largely because it's so difficult to show damages here. And everything here demands damages here. So you've got all these different laws that say, you know what, you know, you are not allowed to do that. But the problem is, if you cannot show substantial damages, there's nothing you can go on. And then there is this concept beyond uh, these kind of laws into privacy, right? Ultimately, whose information is it? Is it uh, my information? Does it make a difference if it's not valuable to me or I can't use it? It's still my information. Is this an invasion, invasion of privacy, an intrusion upon seclusion, something of that nature? And it's all about the reasonable person, whether or not something is so outrageous that it, a reasonable person would never have permitted something like this had they known about it. And the question, who, what is the standard? Is it the normal, the regular user standard that doesn't care about this stuff? Or is it the gamers in here were that were exceptionally upset of having this mysterious uh, code uh, downloaded into their computer system. But on all of this, ultimately, you've got to prove uh, damages. And that's where, I apologize for the noise, but the paper here, we get to the Federal Trade Commission. And that's the one place where we've seen some real, some real progress, uh, some actual actions. Well, Shane Cameron, if they change the use of the software after some time of use, then it is now different to the agreed contract that would require a new contract. It's really problematic because generally in a contract like the web, let's say a website or a even the game, you can say that they can make changes without actually requiring additional consent. They will have to provide notice within it and that's sufficient. But now you're getting into this entire mix of you know, it's a third party software that you're not really disclosing to begin with. And now are they changing it? And what if they change it? What if you disclose the fact that you're using the third party software to collect information, right? And the information as to the collection is true and doesn't change, but what if the capabilities change? So the next time that you download an update, it changes the, the, the code in a way that gives it more capabilities, but it doesn't change what they collect today capabilities versus actual actual what actually they actually are doing today should they be required to give you notice of it so now you you're sitting on software that has a lot more capabilities but it's just not implemented today it gets into a lot of those kind of problems here and the issue is ultimately is do we have a law that can actually protect us here and most people are saying no and that's it's not true here but I've just gone through, what, about six different laws. And the problem being is in all of them, and it's not that the action is not, uh, is not illegal or is permissible because they're not. It's because you cannot sue because there are no quantifiable damages of sufficient magnitude, and that's what's preventing you. The action is still not permitted, but there is no damages. So you cannot sue if there's no damages. Con Clans Sith. I think I'm reading it corrected. Question, what would be a textbook case to look at 
to explain recall laws. I mean, uh, that's definitely not my area of expertise, so I do apologize. But I mean, that's the one they were built for was the mafia. The idea is that you can always go after the person who is killing. But when you want to go after an entire organization that enables it, all you have to do is show show a common enterprise by by those people. And if there is foot soldiers whose job it is to kill, you can go after the higher up who are part of that organization, effectively enabling that. They're not co-conspirators. They're actually liable under RICO. That's the concept usually. Uh, Egal Marcelo Zimit. But against malware, they are soft. They are software against it. Anti-malware software. The question is, what happens when the state is doing that? They are the fact that they are so, the software that is designed to stop it should not be the basis for whether or not it's illegal or not, right? Because even though we don't, our laws look for damages. The, the end of the day, the. Uh, Lost my train of thought there. The fact, what, what are we talking about? Damn, I hate when that happens. Oh, the, the software. The fact that I could have stopped it doesn't, doesn't change whether or not your actions were illegal, right? If you, you know, uh, hacked into a, into a system or you downloaded malicious software into, a, I mean, you put software that then was downloaded to my computer that was malicious in nature, stole, stole information and, and as such. That is completely independent of whether or not I could have implemented any sort of anti-malware software. That that's for your protection, but it doesn't remove the liability from the individual for having uh, done that. Now you can then claim, right? So the question is, could you sue if you had a malware that then caught this? Could you sue? The answer is no, because if you still have to prove damages, the very fact that you had those anti-malware software prevented damage from happening. Again. The, the state might be able to go after these people if or there might be some sort of a class action lawsuit for or other things and we'll talk about why that's where this is really where it moved to the federal trade commission the federal government was able to go after these people without having to prove specific damage of specific act within a specific computer francis or Apatis. if for example you had red shell installed without your knowledge and it was then found out that he had a vulnerability and got hacked. Are the game makers in Red Shell liable? Excellent question, because that, that happens all the time. And the answer is yes. They absolutely are liable for it. When Target was hacked and its data stolen, your data was stolen, absolutely Target uh, was liable because he didn't put enough uh, protection in place. So if they are building software that has capabilities or vulnerabilities, they're going to be liable for it when it uh, somebody... Uh, exploits those the same thing to the developers they are not off the hook just because they got it from somebody else they have certain responsibilities so absolutely they're liable justin white uh the sony rootkit issue i think is a little different the main is the difference is the rootkit causes the system to behave differently it installed itself on the boot, that's the root part, and is not as easy as simply uninstalling it. It's, there is a lot of issues related here too, and we get snippets of information and contradictions, so we don't know if that's true. A big part is also whether or not you can uninstall it, and there's, there is some dicta, some, you know, bits of information that says that some people that try to uninstall specific that software remove it or disable it actually had the entire games crashes and stuff like that so it wasn't able and what they could do only is send request remove my data from your server but they couldn't uninstall it and that's part of the uh, problem whether or not having the software itself regardless of how it behaves and what information is collected whether or not that itself should be held to be illegal Um, HMSP77, have you had any follow-up in, in info on the Crytek lo copyright lawsuit against Cloud Imperium games of the Star Citizens? Uh, no. I've checked, I literally check on it every single day because I find, find it uh, fascinating and I can't wait to see. But the last news, it should come any time, any day now, because I think the last 
time we spoke about it was around the end of April. So we should be getting to around the two months mark. And generally, we've seen lately that the federal courts have been able to uh, issue mo uh, orders when it comes to motion to dismiss within two months. There's no guarantee. It depends on the workload for that particular judge. But that's what. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm going to assume it's going to come any day now. But once everything was submitted for the motion to dismiss, there's nothing to talk about. We're just uh, waiting around for the decision. I didn't check it today, but I've checked it yesterday and I've checked every single day before that. And there was nothing uh, new. I'll let you know as soon as I get anything. Where am I here? Okay. Justin Skip, greeting and salutation. How you doing? I imagine that some people and organization could be interested as third parties in buying that sort of information. That's a big deal, right? And a big part of it. And, and think about it. Red Shell is telling you, we don't care about your information. We send it to uh, the developer. But you don't know if they are retaining copies. Maybe they're retaining copies on their server in order to make sure that when, if the information somehow gets sent and lost or they can uh, rebuild it later on if their customer needs it. Maybe it's for completely uh, reasonable reasons, but you don't know that information. You don't know, right? And since you don't have a privacy policy directly with Red Shell, you don't know if they can sell it to other people. They may tell you they don't, but there is no privacy policy that would bind them to that issue. Your privacy policy with the, is with the developer, the game developer, and that doesn't bind Red uh, Shell's action. It might, it would bind how the developer may use your information that they receive through Red Shell, but not what, what Red Shell does with it. And that's the heart of the issue here, that you have never authorized it. There's no, there's no real restriction. You don't know what kind of contract they have between developer and Red Shell, whether or not it's being restricted. Are the developer overlooking to see what Red Shell is doing with that information? Is Red Shell making sure that the developers are not using their software impermissibly? You have none of that. And that's at the heart. It's a big part of what people are screaming about is that they don't know what's going on. So, which brings us to... Uh, which brings us to the Federal Trade Commission. And the Federal Trade Commission, we talk about many, many times, an independent federal agency that is concerned with consumer protection and making sure that there, there are no anti-competitive actions, right? It's subject to a Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, of the FTC Act. And it's been increasingly uh, active in the online world. So they investigate and the way it gets to them they they don't take on any sort of a problem they're not your local police station usually they would have to receive an, enough complaints about a subject or a specific uh, company for it to merit them looking into it sometimes they get a lot of complaints and they look at they start investigating an entire industry sometimes a specific uh, individual and since early 2000 and uh, 2000s really I, I think the first case was 2004 and they made it explicit at that time that this is our first case when it comes to spyware, but it won't be our last. And in fact, there's been tons of those kind of cases. And to understand what they're doing, I want to show you something. The FTC basically came up with three principles that's going to guide them when it comes to spyware and why they've been pursuing so many different laws. So we're going to go some, through some of the ideas of what they've been pursuing, what they haven't. But I want to show you those kind of guidelines so we can think about in terms of uh, Red Shell. And this is the first one. The first is that a consumer's computer belongs to him or her, not to the software distrib distributor. And it must be the consumer's choice whether or not to install software. This principle reflects the basic common sense notion that Internet businesses are not free to help themselves to the resources of a consumer's computer. It's a testimony that we're saying this in front of the Senate. Several FTC cases allege that the defendants downloaded spyware into their computers without consumer knowledge or consent. So as far as the FTC is concerned, because they were, they've been lobbying Congress for more, for uh, more effectively police power, their ability to sue not only for, for damages, but actually for, you know, 
put a huge uh, 13 million dollar fine on somebody you know civil action in order to make sure it stops but they're saying the first principle is that your computer is yours all information within it is absolutely yours it is your information anybody that wants access to it even if, if nobody thinks it's important needs to get permission so it's all about authorization that's their first principle first and foremost whether or not there is explicit authorization not implicit not well you should have known that kind of like explicit authorization for the download of what will be spyware or malware or anything else here second principle that spyware downloads cannot bury disclosures or material information needed to correct otherwise misleading impression or specifically bearing material information and end user license agreement which will not shield a spyware purveyor this testimony the testimony states it notes that in two ftc cases the defendants failed to disclose adequately that the free software they were offering was bundled with harmful software programs same uh, storyline right so first they need authorization but it's not going to be enough that you buried it in some sort of a disclosure because there have been cases okay that um, under some of those laws that we talked about the six different laws that we have spoken about before where the spyware developer or uh, a company that bundled it together were not ultimately held liable because it was in their privacy policy and the idea is that it's not enough putting in there that you're utilizing in your in your privacy policy that you're utilizing red shell uh, software within it is according to the federal government should not be sufficient even though sometimes the courts held that it was sufficient the federal government's position was it should be much more explicit put it in bold, put it on top, put it as a required uh, approval as part of the sign-up process. It's not enough to bury it because you're just not expecting it. It's something that's unknown. And even if you think that there might be something there, you wouldn't expect that specific iteration of a spyware within your computer. So that's the second uh, item. And the third, the third principle is that if a distributor puts a program on a computer, the consumer should be able to uninstall or disable it. And they had some cases where the companies download software that displayed frequent pop-up ads. The companies deliberately made these adware program difficult for consumers to identify and then to remove. And that's the third one. You know, so according to according to what the federal government wants from the Senate is that we want that to require authorization. We want it to be explicit, not buried in some privacy policy or some disclaimer. And we want this to be easy to uninstall. They should be able to identify. They know it's there. They should be able to uninstall it. So let's think about Red Shell here. According to what the FTC is, says, unauthorized, nobody knew it was being uh, downloaded. There was no explicit authorization. It definitely didn't show up. Did one developer or another, as far as I know, they nobody included in their privacy policy, but even if they did, that should not have been sufficient because it was something so unexpected, it should have been explicit. And third, they should have been able to remove it easily, and at least from some information, we don't have a, a, a lot of it, some people that tried to remove it had the entire game disabled, something they paid for, let's say 60 bucks for. So according to the principles that the FTC is pursuing, as part of what it wants from federal law is that Red Shell would have actually uh, violated that, that this is not it. When it, They're not even talking here about damages here, just talking about what should be permiss permissible, how the Federal Trade Commission is looking at these. And it's important because we've seen it in privacy issues, we've seen it in uh, disclaimers when it came to e-celebrities and on uh, promoters online. Do, do, does every YouTuber uh, give sufficient disclosure that you know, that their show is being uh, sponsored and somebody's paying for it, all this kind of stuff. And those are not explicit laws. Those are effectively regulations passed by the FTC to tell the world, this is how we're going to look and this is how we're going to investigate these kind of items. And believe it, 95% of the entire market follow lines in step with the FTC because nobody wants to be on the receiving end of a investigation by the Federal Trade Commission. 
they're very good in what they do, and it's hell scary. I've had uh, clients whose entire business was completely destroyed by the FTC for something that they felt was inadvertent, violated uh, the regulation, but they felt was completely inadvertent. Nonetheless, you don't want to be on the receiving end. It's a federal agency here. So if you look at that alone, you would see that Red uh, Shell and developers that are actually implementing it have a lot to be concerned about because it's complete violation of what the FTC is actually looking for, the guideline set by the FTC. Doesn't mean that you know, a lot that an investigation and lawsuit will be pursued by the FTC, but it's in violation of what the FTC set as its guiding principle when it comes to allowable uh, spyware. PG Cap, wouldn't the continuous taking of my analytics, which have been have monetary value, be considered a subscription service? Uh, who no, but I mean, uh, who subscription? Meaning, okay, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. The problem with here would be that under FTC regulations, that would have been required. The disclosure would have been required. They would have had to have told people that this is part of a subscription. You're paying $60, and then you have a continuous payment of that. And that would have been explicit. It had to have been on the top separated from everything else the same way they, they do it when it comes to uh, free uh, free trial period subscriptions are actually something that people have to know that they are paying continuously for even if they're paying in the form of providing data so I, I see what you're saying but it would not negate the fact that even more explicit information would have been required Rob Bob 9933. A few months ago, I was updating my AMD CPU drivers during install. A social media application was installed without me being able to uh, avoid it. Let's see. Rubble, rubble. I think that was the last one. So there have been some good, some good segue. There have been that is very, very common. And starting in 04 with the first spyware, lots and lots of lawsuits and. They started out with, with things, the FTC really focused on things that they could show damages like any other law. And over time, it was about things like you're saying. I I installed something unknowing something else was installed, right? And the question is, what does that thing do? It violated, obviously, the principle the FTC is going for, but what did it do? Did it uh, show, do pop-up ads? Did it change... Uh, your uh, search engine did it uh, change search results as a, re as a re result did it slow down your computer did it cause uh, malware so a lot of those kind of spyware malware have been prosecuted by the federal trade commission and very very successfully if i may say so they do a very very good job at it the difficulty is can you is, is dealing with something like uh, red shell here where you you focus it, it violates all the principles so it's not what the ftc would authorize and yet you cannot point to direct damage involved here so what the federal trade commission over time has done is basically what are they doing the federal trade commission they're focusing on anti-competitive behavior consumer uh, basically cheating the consumer right so the idea is if you take pieces of software you don't tell the consumer and they install it in a way that benefits you. Can that be the basis rather than looking at the harm done to the consumer? Because you assume that it's my computer, it's all harm. But rather, if you're using something belonging to me to generate profit for you without my authorization, whether or not that should be the basis for a lawsuit. And that's not easy. But again, the the... the a lot of time, what you what you get when the Federal Trade Commission going after you, you're going to get a settlement out of it, and that's been the reality of it. And not only after the developer, because in reality, it's the developer's responsibility. They take that software, they integrate it into their games, and they download, and they are the one who are not giving you permission, right? Red Shell doesn't really have an opportunity to give you permission because they don't have a direct relationship with you. You never signed to them, so they can say, well, look. We put, give all those capabilities to the developers, which is true. 
And the way their software works is it gives them for instance, the ability to do opt out, but the developer is not required to opt out. You know, so there are certain capabilities built into the software that the developer chooses sometime not to implement. And so definitely the developer should be held liable. The question is about whether or not you can go after Red Shell and the FTC has. I mean, not after Red Shell, but a company just like that. I believe it was right here uh, a little north of me in uh, Florida. So basically a company developed spyware that was has, has capabilities, right? But it marketed itself and provided information how to make it undetectable. So by virtue of the software not easily being detectable, right? They didn't do anything illegal. You can argue that the developers that installed that software could have told people, you know, this is coming. But instead, they made it almost virtually undetectable so that unless a developer actually gave explicit information, nobody would have ever known about it. And the FTC was able to go after these individuals and, and, uh, and uh, reach a settlement that uh, I believe was a settlement, it wasn't uh, a loss, that stopped that practice. And as part of that, there was an agreement to change the concept of it cannot be detected. And that's really what I see in the future of these companies here that they are, will be required to build capabilities that would not enable developers to make a choice about whether or not to uh, provide notice. That it will always be, in order to do this, it will always be, the song will always be uh, observable, always be obvious to people that, that uh, Red Shell is being provided on, that it could not be a tool like that. The problem is, we go back to some of the old cases like the old um, VCRs and stuff like that, the whole Sony Betamax and stuff like that, whether or not recording shows is illegal and the court balances. And now, what? yeah, the device can be used to record shows illegally, but can also be used to record legally. As a result, the maker of the, of the devices, the VCRs of the time, are not liable for it. But when you're building software that is designed to be undetectable, and that's the consequence of it. You, know, you should not be able to hide behind the fact that, well, you know what, they could have uh, gave proper notice of it. So that's what I'm thinking is, is you're looking at the future. I'm not necessarily, I don't know if necessarily Rachel will be prosecuted. I don't think so. But I think there's, there's, there's a lot of investigation. I think this is not going to escape uh, the FTC's side because of all the uh, screaming about it, what's happening. And I think this is going to be built into its own guidelines about not only notice and ability to uh, to remove it, but also again, my, my mind uh, is going blank right now. Whatever I was talking about five seconds ago, then I completely uh, forgot about. Man, that that bothers me. I think I said it already, so I'm, I apologize. I'll jump back to it if I remember it. It's my main, my brain is going numb here. Okay, I'm an hour and a half into it. That's usually what happens within after the first hour. I apologize. Uh, no better name. Hello, good afternoon. How you doing? No, so the biggest thing is that it is illegal, but they, the way they they are doing it makes them not liable because they do not create significant damages. Exactly. There has to be something else, and damages can be described in many many different ways. Some people were able to get to liability by showing that it was somehow anti-competitive and maybe they used it to take information that was of extreme value to them and in a way that harmed competitively the the the, the people from whom it was taken. That's in very, very specific uh, cases. But generally, yes, the laws are, most of the laws cannot go after them because you really can't quantify sufficient amount of damages. Usually, you can't quantify $5,000 worth of damages in this case for the individual within usually that's within a specific year not within the span you know 5000 within a year and the only successful cases that we see over and over again is really the federal trade commission going after this as part of you know anti competitive uh behavior basically going after companies for exactly what it is you know that uh, they they start an investigation that then recommend lawsuits to the district court they actually sue on behalf behalf of uh, of uh, the u.s government and you've seen a lot of successful uh 
prosecution, but usually in those cases you did see damages or they were able to explain damages in ways that were more creative, meaning they were able to say that that uh, the spyware consumed processing power. Even if it's small, it consumed processing power, and, you know, and we could quantify that. Or, or it slowed down a computer. At that point, you're not liable only for the physical damage, but rather things like that. So you can argue, let's say, Let's say you are a, a game developer and your computer is being slowed down by the fact that you downloaded a game into it. That can cause damages far beyond the game itself because it can actually then percolate into your actually daily work and, and, the, and the value associated with it so they can actually grow it. So they were very successful in those uh, cases. Just skip. Also, many people want to run as little software as possible on their computer. It seems to be quite common that they don't have anti, any antivirus. True. And you, you see that definitely in a lot of Macs also. That little Macs are not gaming computers. That uh, people avoid uh, the uh, antiviruses and anti-malware and uh, anti-spyware. All those kind of software. That should not be the base of whether or not you can sue somebody. You should be able to have full protection and yet still... In this case, probably the government going after these people for their unauthorized uh, installation of inform of software that then grabs people information, however valuable or not valuable they are, and sending it to third party. That sh that in itself should be uh, a crime. Again, what I foresee more and more is guidelines by the FTC, such as the one they've set up, and companies trying to avoid it. Now, why did Sometimes it takes a, a scandal, something big to happen for people to react. And I think this actually has a chance of actually working. More and more companies actually dropping Red Shell that I think uh, it will have the effect of actually changing the way both the developers are implementing it, potentially Red Shell, the kind of features and tool it provides. I'd like to see, again, companies like Red Shell being required to put in features that will forbid the forbid the, the those co that that software from actually being undetectable that would probably change everything no better name so would changing the loss of their there would not have to be damages because as much as I don't like company putting spiral in their game but I understand there is no malicious I think that you can change the law. No, I think that you need to have damages, but I think that you can define it as also potential. So if you put in software that is sitting there, especially spyware that is sitting there, it has not done anything malicious, but it's sitting there for the day and it can potentially do so either intentionally or unintentionally or because somebody else is hacking. I think that should be, that should qualify as damages as well. That just that the very fact that you're putting this time bomb on my, time bomb on my machine, that should be sufficient to uh, justify damages, not just if you uh, lit the fuse. Ben Webb, is it possible that the loss of memory or computer space will be considered a loss? My computer doesn't have unlimited space. Yeah, that's exactly what has happened. You can argue, well, it's so minimal, my, my software is efficient. There's been sufficient number of cases where they said it really doesn't matter that, I mean, how you quantify the bottom line, it is finite uh, amount of space and you're consuming part of it. And over time, it's not only a consumption in a moment in time, it's over time, it's running constantly and it can, it can, it can definitely have impact. You know, if you have uh, computers that have limited amount of RAM and, and your software consume, it doesn't take much to have a to have some impact on your computer's performance if it's always running in the back while you're running those games. Ken Clan Smith. Yes, that was the right pronunciation. Uh, I Because we keeping seeing groups online planning to take action against a victim to be carried out by goons. I ask because you keep it. Okay, Ken Clan Sith. Clan Sith. Is because we keep seeing groups online planning to take action against victim to be carried out by goon. Interesting. I didn't hear of that. I mean, I know what you're saying. I didn't hear of of people reacting that, that way. No better name. 
intent with their inclusion of software, but would they be liable if someone hacks their, their spyware and uses it against their users? Absolutely. That's it. That's exactly uh, that. That it happened many times, and it happens outside of it. Like I said, in when Target got hacked, when Sears got hacked, they're liable for it. Obviously, if you find the person who hacked, they'll be liable as well. But doesn't relieve the company because ultimately because they are collecting your information and they are responsible for protecting it. If they don't do it nowadays, industry standard does not mean that any sort of hack would be they would be liable for it but it's usually because there's vulnerability within their system and they failed to uh to to take care of it in a way that would measure up to what an industry standard would be that's usually 99 percent of the time it's not because you know you have the best system in the world but somebody was so brilliant and they hacked into your system it's because you really failed to meet industry standards that uh somebody did it either procedurally or actually technologically didn't implement the right tools so yes, you definitely are. Tiva Lester, for everyone that came in late, don't forget to hit the like. Uh, thank you so much. Please hit the like on the, on the on the video. Francis Rapatas, if you if you own your information and Red Shell collects it without permission and presumably sells it back to a game developer, can that be seen as a sort of a theft? That's exa absolutely. That's the whole concept of trespass to chattel we talked about in the beginning. That. It, whether or not they're taking your information, that would be one of them, or that could be a trespass. It could also be through the, the Computer Fraud Act where uh, they are they are essentially hacking into your system because it was an unauthorized access to your computer system. The idea that they are either keeping that information, they are sending it out, they're selling it, would be considered can be considered the theft the problem with it and you'd have to quantify the damages there and that's where it's failing because if i'm taking all that information and i agree that it's yours and the big problem is there's no law in the united states right now that says that information is yours the eu would say that but not the united states so there's no law that says that all this information they gather including your username which should, seems to me ridiculous because it's absolutely uh, an identifying uh, mark. It's absolutely something that either on its own or with a combina with an, a combination of another item can use to identify you personally. So the concept that somehow the your ID is uh, your user ID is not uh, personal information is, is absurd to me. It's really old way of looking at it. But uh, it falls down to the concept that that all this information is collected and they can't quantify it. They can't figure out, okay, what is ultimately the damage associated with it? And that's why the laws are failing. You know, uh, so I think the law can get to the point where they're saying it's your information. The law would have to change because they're not saying it right now. And it's a theft. But what are your damages? Because you can't sue for a dollar really uh, for that. Just skip. If these games were sold on Steam, as an example, shouldn't it be in the interest of Steam to protect themselves too by forcing this kind of things to be public? That's a big part of what people are asking for. Why doesn't Steam actually identify on the sales page of each game whether or not it includes a red shell? That Steam, for the protection of its own users, not that it would be certainly legally sufficient, but that Steam should be on the forefront of doing it because they do it in other cases where they're providing notices depending on different games. They should be providing it based on third-party that the inclusion of these kind of third-party uh, ad services. And I think if there's enough push by users, Steam will react. Because Steam in the past has reacted to user feedback, negative user feedback, and they've implemented changes in it. I think that's something they can work on. And maybe that will be the big positive out of this, uh, that Steam actually will change it. That way doesn't solve all your problem when it's outside of Steam, but at least that will give you some warning. Plus, if Steam was able to say to game developers that if you don't report it to me and I don't put it on and we find out that you included some sort of a spyware in your game, you will, your account will be terminated. If Steam controlled that, that's a great, uh, that's a great, that, that's a, that's what policemen would do, basically would do. So that can have a real impact. PG Skep. If X software is released by X for free with no terms and condition using Red Shell, would someone be held responsible? 
Well, yeah, because you, you that those lawsuits happen. The FTC, again, if definitely if there is consequence to it, if because I mean, in the beginning, especially there was there still now really. I mean, this you are you get access to download software. Let's say Microsoft for nine ninety nine, right? When it's going to cost you otherwise a hundred dollars through uh, another service. If you didn't realize they're downloading other things into your computer beside what it is. That's the kind of stuff that the FTC has gone after. They've actually uh, did investigated and, and uh, petitioned the district courts for uh, to prosecute as, as well. When regardless of whether it's free or paid or paid for, the inclusion of uh, spy spyware, unauthorized uh, code within uh, your game that is that collects and transmit information without authorization and not the ability to remove it. That's what they're going after. So yes, that can absolutely be, they can be led liable for it. Pepe Lafayre, sorry I missed the first hour. If this is a repeat, does it make any difference with EU data protection laws versus US one? Yes, like I said before, in uh, the EU, there's an argument whether or not this would pass mustard because the argument, which I can't really answer by Redshell, is that their software is GDPR compliant, compliant with the EU privacy uh, laws, that it's the implementation by the developers that is not uh, compliant. It's not there. I don't know if that's true or not, because the idea ultimately in the EU that has to be opt-in. You have to get people's permission before you can collect their information. The US doesn't have that, doesn't have requirement of opt-in versus opt-out. As a result, 99% of the time, it's an opt-out kind of policy that as long as they include it within some sort of a privacy policy that nobody's going to read, they can start collecting your information. You have the, the right to opt out. And that's what the FTC through those three guiding principles are trying to change when it comes to spyware. Sorry, Justin, why you skip Lucifer love toys question. Oh, I apologize. Uh, are you entitled to a refund if you installed the game but you object to something in the EULA? If uh, the answer is yes, if you are paying, it depends how it works, right? If before you pay, you are presented with the EULA or the opportunity to read because there was a link, then you cannot claim afterwards that you are objecting to that EULA. You have no rights to it, right? Because you were presented before you actually purchased it. But if it's the other way around, where you are uh, first paying and then shown a EULA as part of the installation of it, then yeah, you you are you you should be able to get. And if they don't give it to you, that's a problem that uh, that you should uh, start tweeting about and put it into Reddit and stuff like that. Because absolutely, it all depends what happens first. That's why. In the old days, I don't know how many of you are uh, were, are old enough to remember, the EULAs came in shrink wrap. So you had your, your uh, CD games and it will all shrink wrap or before that in in in, uh, in, uh, in your in your game discs. And they were shrink wrapped with a sticker that included the EULA. The idea being that you were shown the EULA before you ever ripped the package, before you got in. So once you entered, once you ripped the package, you it's too late to object to the EULA. And the same thing holds here. Shane Cameron, if they make this bit of software illegal, they will always find another way to sneak their way into your computer. I agree. I mean, um, it's almost impossible to make a law like this, but that's why you... I generally have liked what the FTC has done over the years when it came to some of the online world because they have published guidelines and they're very, very good in that. Sometimes they have overstepped and you no, know, their guidelines say one thing and then they've gone off just they've said, well, we've changed our mind and that causes problem. But they publish these, these guidelines and principles and they hold all these. I mean, you can you can follow the FTC online and they will announce when they're going and they're going to do a a presentation, they're going to talk and they're going to ask for input about all, a lot of these kind of issues. They're very, very comprehensive in the, in the way they're, they're doing it. But they set up uh, guidelines and they change it over time as they learn more and more of what's problematic. And by virtue of their strength and 
people's fear of them, they get things done. The FTC has done more to advance privacy issues in the United States than the law ever did because the law is really set back 20 years ago. And although we have some change on the state level that then, then percolates, so California has been on the forefront of some privacy issues that has helped the rest of the country. But effectively, it's the FTC through its prosecution and its publishing of its guidelines and its statements of what their guiding principles are that have made companies change their behavior. So even if the laws don't change with respect to this, and I do believe that we need some change, especially when it comes to privacy, we, we need to make some basic laws, not very specific, but basic ones that declare that all this information is ours. So whether or not it's my IP address or, you know, what operating system I'm using, that still is my information. And you need to have explicit authorization before you can actually uh, collect it, sell it or anything else. And we retain rights over it. I can see a law like that passes. And then I see the FTC through its regulatory capabilities, ability to to uh, make announcement and, and uh, draft guidelines and seek uh, public input on how it should police these laws based on some of that. I uh, I think that would that that has worked very well in the past, and I suspect that if they, if we went that far, that would work as well. No better name. Well, thank you. I will catch you next week, Lior. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Justin White. Off topic, but I'm curious. Is that a Triscoll you are wearing around your neck? It looks like I'm where I am wearing one too. I don't even know what the word Triscoll means, so I'm apologize. And it's no, it's something much more specific. It's it's a boat propeller. I mean, Florida, we boat a lot, so it's just a propeller from uh, an outboard. I mean, that's what it represents. Uh, Khan's clan Sith. In the case of diversity comics, there have been groups on social media plotting to have a rival comic book creators attacked by fans. That is one series of instances. Oh, okay. I, I've been reading about uh, that. I I really don't understand it from um, from anybody's perspective. I, mean, I understand what's happening. I just don't understand why it's happening. And you have to be careful here on both sides of the aisle. I obviously find the idea that, look, object to people's speech all you want to, fight speech with speech, by all means, you find somebody's speech abhorrent, unacceptable, speak out against it. But when you're trying to either deplatform, prevent them from speaking, I think that acts against you. And when you're trying to prevent them from speaking through their businesses, that's unrelated to their speech, right? So the creation of comic books that's unrelated to speech, I find, I, I just, I mean, that, that, that is so antithetical to the U.S. view on uh, freedom of speech. But you also have to be careful on the other side, that you can, if you are in support of free speech and in support of people's ability to make whatever statement they want in the world and people not try to deplatform them through all these actions, be careful then not to overreact when you see it on the other side, don't try to stop their speech or deplatform them. Don't fight against people. Don't fight against people that are so anti-speech by trying to block them and do the same thing to them. Because sometimes we react in the same way that we oppose, and uh, we're not going to get anywhere there that way. Francis Rapadas, thank you for explaining the things in easily digestible format. By the way, thank you so much. Even a lay person like me can follow along and wrap my hand around the concept because of you. Great job. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the compliment. I like the awesome astronaut portrait behind you. What is the name of it so I can find it? It's at the bottom of every single one of my videos, the name of the artist. It's a local artist here in Miami that became famous for it's all done by hand, spray painted. He, he basically does this kind of things on Lamborghinis, on on, uh, on all the supercars. He did this for Lenny Kravitz. He did this for the very famous people. And this came up in a charity auction for my kid's school. And I picked it up. So, um, but the name of the guy is Jonas Serwinski. I believe that's the, the artist is at the bottom. Look his name up. You'll see some really cool stuff he does. Justin White. Is in the creation of a comic book speech? Oh, that no, that's exactly it. That I am 
I have no problem if the if a comic book is in itself, let's say, political speech, and you want to speak against it. I have no problem with that. I have a problem with deplatforming people, where the result is that you are trying to prevent him them from selling the, those uh, comic books. Now, you would argue that, and I and I agree with that, that every single comic book owner ownership uh, shop has the right to speech as well. And they can speak by not including that comic book shop. I think, I, I don't argue, that's absolutely true, that you speak in, in multiple ways here. But I don't like the mob mentality that is designed to try to effectively force the deplatforming of uh, speech. So while each comic book store can actually prevent uh, a comic book from being on their shelf because it's their right to speech just as much as the right of the comic book uh, writer to speak as well. It's the mob mentality that then tries to force those actions on those platforms, basically trying to shut down people. Never try to shut down people. Speak against them. That's the best way to do it. But it is, absolutely. A comic book itself is, ab is absolutely protected speech. Con Clan Sith. I have no problem with speech and disagreement. It is people plotting for violence? That is why I ask about Rico. I know it could be. I know it could be tricky. Yeah, I mean you got to connect real illegal activity like uh, violence against people that are uh, within a concerted uh, organization, and that's difficult because a lot of time what you're seeing online. And again, I'm not an expert in Rico, but I can talk about the other stuff. Is that there is no direct connection I'm, i can call incitement is so specific in the united states it's literally me telling you to go right let's meet right now on the street corner to attack somebody and it's immediate if i say something and it happens a month later that's not incitement so people calling for action generally does not necessarily connect them to the people that actually commit the action and it's unclear whether or not you can connect Rico to something like that because they're not usually in the same they're not part of a of, a, of an organization something like that's usually how they try to define the mafias by actually charting out the organization those usually don't exist so usually you can apply that kind of a law red risotto triscal is a symbol repeat in three in a triangle a bull propeller would be a triscal normally used with a symbol of religious spiritual nature common in logo design Cool, I never knew that. So, a propeller is a triscal. So, I guess I have a triscal. Um, PG Skip. What if Red Shell is part of a software library that a developer used to create his software and like the end user, he did not expect Red Shell would be included? Who, who is then liable? He is liable. He's absolutely liable. I mean, if you, whether or not you write the software directly or you use off-the-shelf software that includes something that you didn't understand was included in it, you're still liable for it, especially if it causes some measurable damage. And I'd like to argue that any impact on my computer is damaged, and it's probably beyond the, the physical calculation of it because it impacts my day work, it impacts everything that I do, and over a span of the year, it's, there's a cost that's probably immeasurable here. Nonetheless, um, I think... We are at, we're coming to two hours. I think we're going to finish up. Let me know if there's anything else, guys. Oh. No, that's, I think that was it. Right. It was just uh, skimming through that. I think we pretty much did it. What, what again, what we see has been successful is the Federal Trade Commission. As you see, the Federal Trade Commission delivering, I mean, not only prosecuting a lot of different cases, and there have been lots and lots of spyware claims being prosecuted they've also gone after the actual developers even though the developers themselves have not been uh, the ones who actually spread th that software they've gone out of them and they got them to actually change their software in such a way that it's not hidden that there is no way for it to be hidden and i think they're, they're setting a principle that would over time uh prevent this kind of behavior by uh companies like red shell and developers who permit who uh, permitted because you don't want the uh, Federal Trade Commission coming after you. Bottom line is that, uh, that Rachel doesn't want it, now developers want it. 
Con Clancy, thank you so much. This was informally. Thank you. Justin White, thank you for addressing all our comments. Great. If I missed something, I apologize. You said that I skipped one, guys. Uh, hopefully I answered it correctly. If you have any other questions, any concerns, anything you want to talk about, just leave them down below. I'd love to talk to you. I'll see you next time.